Is it safe to take the ketone esters and coffee? Yeah, it's perfect. Oh, actually. fuck, I haven't done it my fucking ketone fires esters. you up. Oh, well, you just give them to us and you don't have one. Yeah, throw that thing. Uh, throw that thing to us. I'm not going to lie to you. That's one of the worst things I've ever done. It's tasted. gross. It's dude. fucking disgusting. It's gross. Are they upfront about that? Yes. Do they say, hey, like, no, this he is going to do great things for you, but you're going to have to choke it down? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Just the smell makes me fucking heave. I Jeez. made the mistake of smelling it too. Whole thing. Whole Gentlemen, thing. Whole thank thing. you, sir. It's Kim. Kim? Thank you, Kim. Yeah, thanks, Kim. What the fuck is going on here with this coffee pot? Hey, this is fucking embarrassing. It's trash. It's fucking embarrassing. You know, embarrassing. the only way it'd be worse if it was a Jesus French press. Christ, if only dude. I had a friend in my network that did coffee really baller with uh, the coffee equipment. <laughs> No, if only, <laughs> if only, if only I was just one text away as to what, what espresso, you you what, what espresso me. machine should I fucking put in my house? Me. Do you still use that spin one? No, it broke. I bought I, my, I bought one right you know after I saw you. That's like, you're the one who told me that was a good one. That is a good one. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. I never use it because it's entry that's level. easy. You know? I mean, it's kind of like, like if, if, when I, when I learned how to drive a truck. Hey guys, what do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you guys do? Uh, didn't you guys? You guys were originally going to do K cups. They do. We do. Jesus Christ, man! Do you even pay attention? I have never seen a fucking K cup. Do you have K cups in your BRCC? Oh my god, dude! I, Evan, I, I show up here two days ago. Oh I'm god. wearing a Fieldcraft Survival shirt that he doesn't recognize, <laughs> and he looks at it and he goes. Oh, that's awesome. Where'd you get that? And I'm like, I'm a member of your t-shirt club, <laughs> you fucking idiot. That's true. You have too that much did going, happen. You have too much going on. Not, I don't have anything going You've on. You've never seen a BRCC K-Cup. They're all they were, over the fucking place. That, that's not what I meant. There were racks of I, them I, at the I misspoke. Shop. I literally made one yesterday at headquarters because we have your K-Cups. I meant that version. Oh, oh, cleared hot. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. The... This thing? The Nespre oh, Nespresso. Yeah, but it's like the... It's not a K-Cup. Yeah, it's not a K-Cup. That version no. of it is what I that, mean. The, 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 there's, not, there's just not that many people out there that drink it. Like That kind of... No, um, there's yeah. just not. Mm. It, and honestly... But what do you prefer? I mean, in me? personal selection. If, yeah. I'm gonna, if I have the choice between a K-Cup and an espresso pod, it's always an espresso pod. Yeah. But if I have a choice between ground coffee... Nespresso or K cup, it's always ground coffee. And then if hundred percent like of the time with a pour yeah. bean, yeah, yeah, of course, like yeah. it's hundred percent. I like Nespresso because I like shit in my pants in the morning. That's just what I'm a fan of. Yeah, yeah, dude, yeah. that shit. I had to stop drinking it because I had damage to my intestinal tract from pooping five times a day. Those really? things are serious. The Nespresso pods? Yes. Huh. Interesting. I, I, get, I like just we gave. need to have a medical intervention yeah, because yeah. have I you had one of those? I don't know. Yes. Dude, it's are like you yes, sir? Mike? And you don't poop. Do you drink it out of a this? thimble? Are you trying to concentrate? I have things? superior Korean gen genetics. No, I think you're. I, I, like I think I, I you guys think, have Somalia. Uh, I, I think you're Ethiopian stacking. Ethiopian genetics. I think you're stacking. You don't stack kimchi on espresso. That's what you yeah. don't do. There's I, like <laughs> certain. There's certain rules of the road when it comes to clean shorts. Don't stack kimchi on espresso. There's a reason why I you eat don't do kimchi that. for breakfast exactly. every morning. Do you know? <laughs> I sometimes do. I do. I just like fermented mm. vegetables. Oh man, I do. Love, I do love kimchi. Where's that? I gotta lie. get show you guys the salt. Uh, can you hand me that uh, the salt thing right there? I was checking those out. Yeah, the the cylinder thing. You're saying this has got some heat to it, right? Dude, I don't. This this just showed up. Have I showed you? Have you seen this? No. So this guy takes this salt. It's called it's it's called Firecracker Farm. Okay. And he puts the salt infused with ghost pepper in uh -huh. that, so you get all the spice. Taste it. It's actually really good. No, this is a thing. You put oh. salt in your coffee. I was gonna say people are That's laughing right. about it. They've never seen somebody salt their coffee. It actually is not uncommon. It's actually legit. Mm -hmm. I need a little bit more. Hey, Kim, can you hit me with a spoon? Thanks, dog. Appreciate it. Ooh. You never salted your coffee? Oh, I have before. Yeah, it can kill yeah. the bitterness. I'm my, a, I'm a fan. my grandpa used to do this thing that I, I I love, which is he yeah, used to put good. salt in his beer. Really? All the time, yeah. My grandma used to take crushed ice and put salt on crushed yeah, ice. That's good. And eat the crushed ice with salt on it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. She died really Korean young. Too? She died really young. Huh? <laughs> is that a Korean thing? I, dude, it's a white I Georgia like that. thing. She's what is Georgia. that? I like that. This it's soon? I, No, that thing. I like that Dude, it is amazing. So it's um, it's called Firecracker Farms, the name of the thing, but it's called the, the Hot Pepper or the yeah, that's Jose. Hard. I'm screwing that up, man. I don't even know. He's got to find out for me. Speaking of Korean stuff, 
we have to address the elephant in the room here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you went on Tucker Carlson, were you just trying to look as Asian as human possible? <laughs> Dude, it's the angles. Those guys had me at weird angles. They had me samurai out. I'm like, no, this dude. show is racist. No wonder Tucker no, got dude. kicked off the you air. Fucking, he got like, kicked off the air because that. I feel like supposedly like a katana blade, and we're shaving your yeah, fucking head. Shit. And you were like, had a picture of Mr. Miyagi like, up in your fucking yeah, your inspiration yeah. corkboard thing. Like, so true. I saw that picture, and I was like, Mike, what the know, fuck, man. dude? I was very samurai in that. Yeah, I, supposedly I, that's why Tucker had to go. Is that what it was? That was the controversy. <laughs> yeah. Something about Asians. That was when he started hitting you with math questions. I, it was fun. Tucker's, play, you know, I was, you got, you've done Tucker before. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Have you done his late night show? No, I did the uh, the hour long, the daylight day, yeah, day sh- the main main or yeah. the Florida. Yeah. So the Florida one, his damn, and I love this because he just got attacked on this where they said they claimed like all these people were in a hostile work environment, and this lady who did the lawsuit hasn't even met Tucker. She worked for the staff, but his staff is so big at the network. But he literally only works with a handful of people. Yeah. And the the room is the size of this kitchen. It's like no, small. I mean, it's, the size of this studio, this yeah. advanced studio. And and mm. it's small. It's oh, like, yeah. I was like underwhelmed by how simple it was. I loved it. It was so cool. Yeah. What I had a blast. the next best move for him? Um, I, I hope it's independent. I hope he's yeah. independent. Yeah. I don't Does know. Does he already I, have a podcast? He, I think he did for a while because he, he had something... In, it was like um, the Daily That's Report or, or one of these. I forget exactly what. what he's his, partnered Daily Caller. In Daily the Caller. Daily Caller. Yeah, That's what it was. So maybe he immerses himself, uh, immerses himself completely into that. Maybe he goes over to Daily Wire. Daily Rumble. Wire or Rumble. I, I don't know. I mean, the world kind of like, he can kind of go anywhere he wants to. And crush it. He will. He'll he'll absolutely crush he just, it. If he doesn't have a podcast, he could start one in a YouTube channel and have like four million subscribers over tomorrow. He has seventy four yeah. million views on that tweet that he did for that that whatever that his response where he said, um, see you soon. Which is a really legitimate like a legitimate conversation where he cannot ask anybody anything without somebody being emotionally charged mm-hmm. and acting insane. And if all of a sudden, if you do that, then every network on the left tries to cancel you, which is what they try to do. CNN is, I mean, CNN talked about the reason he got fired in speculation was because of a, a January 6 lie. Like he was lying about January 6. Mm. He hasn't lied about anything according to January 6. He even reported facts and showed video from the Capitol Hill uh, police that weren't released to the public and the Capitol Hill police never saw. Mm. And where they showed them, escort them through the building and all that stuff. And for some reason, anything he says is attacked by the, um, we know this, but it's like, it's hard. It's, I, I think anytime you don't fit a narrative, you know, you're, you're going to be beat up by one side or the other, right? It's just, it's just the way life is. And I think one, he's hilarious. Like the guy could probably go into stand up tomorrow and have, an incredible career it's like, super intelligent I, and funny really funny down to earth really nice guy great family like i went out to maine and great host like we just had dinner like normal people with everybody that was there meaning like it people think of these these i guess talking heads and probably a lot of them they're really pretentious they're aloof mm-hmm. they're completely disconnected from reality we're having dinner with like his friends from Maine, like long table in a barn. Yeah. And I, I think there's something to be said about just people having an opinion, understanding the difference between facts and opinion, and then saying, it's okay. You can disagree with people. It's totally fine. That's, that's like kind of life. You're going to disagree with a lot of different people. And then when you don't like something, then you can just be enraged all the time. What is this like? Uh, the, the internet is, is, um, I shouldn't say it's the internet. It's like social media has created a platform for a cacophony of fucking retards to just continue to run their mouths all the time. And you don't know if they're like 14 or 56. Who cares? But at the end of the day, it's like guys like Tucker aren't going anywhere. He's not. He's not going anywhere. He's a permanent fixture. It might be better for him. I think he actually... You're talking about getting attacked by the left. I mean, for better or worse, I don't really don't give a shit where people get their news because I actually think it's completely biased 
in yeah, direction. It is. But him being attached to Fox News is going to elicit a response just because mm-hmm. of that attachment. It's not even necessarily the message. It's the knee-jerk response in the other direction, just like they do. You know, the right does back towards the left. So, yeah, he might be better off in the long run anyway, doing his own yeah. thing. Well, there's a, there's this thing, right, where I think about it all the time where – just for people to be people where we can sit, we can sit around and have conversation and it's fairly controversial depending on the people that are listening to it, but it's really not. I, I went back and I was, I was, um, I was watching some old South park episodes not too long ago. It's like those guys have been in business for 20 plus years with a cartoon and they've been pushing it from politically correctness, they've been pushing it across the line for 20 plus years. Yeah. There's a huge voice of Americans that are just like, yeah, it's funny. Shut the fuck up. Who cares? Like it, it, this, this like outrage mafia that just kind of continues to be, I guess, overwhelmed with just information. And then they think that whatever they say is substantive and it creates value. Part of it, I think is it's just sport for internet losers. And, it's it one it's pretty easy just to mute because you're like oh whatever who cares you know move on with our lives but after a while you're like yeah it's just kind of stupid there's just like this continuing uh it it doesn't evolve it just goes down further and further and further and people are watching less and less information and there's less interest people aren't even interested in seeing it they just want to be like yeah I'm, i'm outraged like the bud light thing i was thinking about this about light thing like don't buy Bud Light. Like, who the fuck cares? <laughs> like, yeah. why are all these people getting so mad? They're like, okay, dude, it's funny. It's actually kind of funny to me where, yeah, people are outraged and it's creating billions and billions and billions of views for Bud Light specifically. Yeah. Just vote but with your wallet, man. Just vote with your wallet. You yeah. walk into a grocery store and all you have to do is literally take the Bud Light out of your refrigerator, throw it in the garbage, Go to the grocery store and buy something else. Which, if it's you're listening, super to this, easy. you should do anyway because it's piss. It's yeah, it's just garbage. Dog shit. Yeah, yeah. I haven't drank Bud Light since like 1990. Like never. Like I've never drank that shit. What it's you, garbage. It's piss. What do you typically? Are you more into like soju? Are you? Yeah. You stick to soju. R- any kind of time? rice wine, wine. <laughs> rice based. You know what's <laughs> it's funny is Anheuser Busch. All the beer that Americans drink is rice based. It's all grain. It's rice grain. Is it really? All the, I didn't know all that. All the most pop, because the, huh. you, the grain industry can't keep up with the demand of, of beer. Hmm. But rice can, so it's a, a lot of the rice is actually imported. Are you and sure? I swear the, I've the seen top, Budweiser commercials that are like those fucking Clydesdales running. Tr- yeah, yeah. They're, they're running over Asians in rice patties. That's what they were doing. It's like, I have not hmm. seen that commercial. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> seen that. <laughs> is that, is that, that, that a, is that an Asian specific? Yeah. <laughs> if it, they did make that commercial... Uh, on top of their current controversy, that might be... It's on live leak. Bud Light's pissed, but I I agree with you. The whole controversy is dramatic and nobody cares. You know what? I I actually want to ask you guys, because I don't... The jokes are hilarious out of it, though. The memes are The memes are awesome. They're hilarious. The memes are funny. I I have never... We obviously uh, live on purpose in our own little echo chambers because it makes us happy. Not me. Yeah, you Uh, totally... And it's miserable. <laughs> You're totally inclusive. <laughs> um, but I've always seen the like the outrage, the the transsexual outraged dude at you know protesting for you know the right for children to get transitions. All those things that I see on social, I never see in real life. I have no. So I'm not. And and so the the thing that I actually ask myself a lot is. When we see this social media stuff, like I, I started doing, uh, me and John, my media guy, started doing prep life in the basement. And the concept was I was going to do prep life a couple times a week, talk about the things that are important in news, kind of distill the news, talk about how it relates to preparedness, things that relate to people that are important that we think are to people, is especially in the market. Is it called prep life in the basement? It is. Do prep, prep life It's prep life, but it's definitely in the basement. <laughs> okay. but two, two Koreans in the basement yeah. talking Koreans, about prep. Mike. Yeah. Potentially some butt fucking guys. No, there's none of that. <laughs> I knew he was going to go to that. None of that. We have to censor this whole thing. It can't be on Spotify, Apple. What are you talking Just kidding. About? It can't be. Put on um, I, but when I went down the basement of my own house and we talked about it. I was like, 
I want to be at home. I don't want to be in LA in a studio or I want to be at my house with my kids running around upstairs. And so when I did that, I thought about Tucker and how he's built his infrastructure because he's so like these people who thought it was the dominion thing. None of the things that were brought to the case had anything to do with Tucker Carlson, by the way, like all the conscious. In fact, the lady who was the controversial subject of the investigation for voter fraud and and their case, which they had a profound case, obviously, because Fox News paid out seven hundred and eighty seven million dollars. Tucker Carlson denied her in a text and said, I'm not going to have her on the show. Like, there's nothing vetted about this. Like, I don't trust this. So his way of operating, which is his character, his ethics, his morality, and his 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 ability to kind of operate in a small team allows him to distance himself from the bullshit. The world gets outraged on the left when he says something, but in his family, in his home, none of that affects him. And I'm taking lessons because I used to pay attention to all the bullshit that people said because I thought it was my responsibility. And then I realized... People are fucking crazy. You can't you can't look into the world. You've been pretty good at it. You actually some people have crazy. trained me a little bit on it. Where you're like, dude, don't do that. And so, if you engage, oh, that's not what I said. I said something like that. Pick and choose. Pick and choose. Trolling people on the internet is not something you should completely get rid of. Mm-mm. No, it should Mm-mm. be a honed craft, like a yeah. scalpel coming across. You literally just yeah. did that yesterday. I just saw it recently. <laughs> as of recent of yesterday. Occasionally, of yesterday. I will do that. Yeah, if the opportunity presents itself, oftentimes it's in the Black Rifle Coffee comment section. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we just, here's the, the lesson learned is we just need to continue to insulate and be able to disseminate that information out into the world. And if people res- like it, they, they pick it up. If they don't, they lay it down. I would change that. Don't insulate. I would say isolate yourself and provide, provide yourself distance. Yeah. <clears throat> If That's you, key. Like, in, well, maybe you mean a different term of isolate, but I think if you only surround yourself with the echo chamber and you're not aware of what's going on, that can be bad. But isolate yourself from people's ability to actually interact with you directly. Like yeah. not everybody should have a single point of contact directly to anybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really. Yeah. You know, and that's the feature of media. I mean, mainstream media. I think even Don Lemon leaving CNN, which you, you put on the on the left side, obviously, and then and Tucker leaving on the right side. Dan Bongino left a week before because they couldn't get through his contract. I think everybody's just realized with Tucker leaving, if you're a conservative, that mainstream, um, mainstream media is completely compromised. I mean, there's nothing left. I don't I think, think there's one voice in reason. If you have an IQ that has two digits, you probably realized it was compromised before yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So what's the future of media? YouTube? I think it's constantly evolving. Yeah. You know, podca- oh, how old is podcasting? 10 plus years? Uh, yeah. Uh, tw- yeah, it's longer than that. It's 20. YouTube, Spotify. Really? Yeah, it's 20. Yeah, I started so. podcasting nearly a decade ago. Wow. And I was, we, there was only, when I started podcasting, there was a couple thousand podcasts. Mm-hmm. And we, nobody thought it was move the needle on anything. I just thought it was fun. Yeah, but now there's like, so Spotify has video, audio, YouTube, obviously, you could host your own platform mm-hmm. and post it to all of those or audio only, depending on what your entry level you want to spend on equipment getting into it. I'm not even like I've heard the term rumble, but I know there's a bunch of mm-hmm. other versions of that. Like, it's difficult because it, it's almost like everybody's partitioning people's attention and it's and it's difficult to get past the screen time. Like we're doing it in an app uh, for Phil Crap, but the apps TV, mostly TV based so we could pull people's attention that would normally be watching TV and they can get education. Hmm. But if you try to compete in the app space, there's only three major players. I mean, it's gonna be Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. Right. I mean, YouTube is somewhere in there as well, but it's, it's difficult. Speaking of podcasts, this is the reintroduction of the Black Rifle Coffee podcast. Can you talk about, because I've got asked the question, like podcasts gone offline for a period of time, things have, have changed, changed, yeah. evolved, changed, changed. Yeah. I they, got that too. Changed like that. You they that changed. Yeah. I was gonna grab right yeah. That's phonetic that Korean, guys. Thanks yeah. for being yeah. racist again. That's how we say it in our native tongue. Yeah, I, it. I think, I think none of us were really that happy with it. I think you know we've 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 really tried to think about it as something that we we wanted to do on a weekly on a weekly basis with you know BRCC and the you know myself, Matt and Jared. 
Logan. And then the last year we've been so busy that it's kind of taken, it's, it's not even the back burner. It's like way in the back burner. And if you're going to do something, we need to do it right. And we also need to be able to do it with the people that people want to listen to. So, you know, we, we've spent some time over the last couple of months just trying to figure out what, what do we want this thing to be when it grows up? And, um, thank goodness we have, you know, good partners and good listeners because, you know, I think that we owe them a really good show. And when I say good, it's not like quality information. Cause I mean, it's just like most of us, the three shooting, of us talking, yeah. talking shit, but, uh, it, it became something where it was like, we have to do this. We have to have somebody, you know, doing it all the time. And I want it to be, I want it to be something that's creating value in people's lives, whether it's, you know, substantive information uh, that's going to help somebody or make them laugh or just make them feel like they're sitting at the table shooting the shit. But I don't want it to be um, over serious. Yeah. You know, I don't know if that makes, if that makes sense. So I, I think, think it's an important part of your brand. It's uh, if you're like, if you, if you, if your touch point to BRCC was you join the coffee subscription, mm -hmm. right? And you get like whatever, two bags delivered to yourself a month and you enjoy the coffee. That's awesome. I think there's more value in understanding. Like, I wonder why they call this, this blended coffee. Like who the right. fuck came up with the idea of lava mm -hmm. Panther? Why did he have that idea? Oh, what's this guy all about? And I say that because I have been shocked at the number of people who have come into the coffee shop and they just, they're like, they have no idea what the brand actually stands mm -mm. for or what the people who founded the brand or about, or are their experiences. So I end up having conversations with people over cups of coffee, like filling them in on what the brand actually stands for. And they love it. Yeah. It's a, it's like a deeper uh, explanation and tie in to the brand itself beyond a cup of coffee. Well, I think a lot of people, they don't, they don't quite understand because if they're new to the brand, they think it's just a really, really big you know, it's really big and it's like, you know, I don't know what their perception is because I'll serve coffee on Saturdays. Typically I'll go into the office and I'll serve coffee out of Salt Lake. So I'll just do, you know, pull some shots in the espresso machine or do Chemex or whatever it is because I love coffee. I was just, I just got back from the um, especially coffee association uh, expo in Portland. And it's, it's something I've been doing since the early two thousands before I had a coffee company because I love coffee. And I think a lot of people, they, they, they think the coffee company is just marketing or whatever it might be. And I'm like, no, I, I started roasting coffee like a long time ago mm -hmm. to solve a problem. Like I wanted to roast great coffee, bring it with me on deployment because all we had was like beans and brews and it was total dog shit. It was horrible. So as a coffee guy, I was just looking to solve a problem. So I bought a little roaster and started roasting. And I used to watch the guys dip with the instant coffee. Yeah. I never had a cup of coffee till I was 27. What? Oh, yeah, dude. It was late. Same. Fucking weird. Later. Same. Yeah. yeah. But I remember why, I didn't understand it. I was like, why would you do that? That looks disgusting. And they were literally just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like with the shitty MRE gum. Yeah. yeah. So, so bad. Like, yeah. What the fuck? So bad. Yeah. And I, I, I would, I was working in Kirkuk at the time and you know, another guy was talking about roasting coffee. We were all kind of all in the same, same spot. It was like me, this guy V diamond, which I think you remember. He was also a team guy. Um, and there's another guy here, uh, Edwin, not Edwin Parnell, but a different Edwin. And, um, we were all talking about coffee and how we could get a better coffee, blah, blah, blah. It was like, we were just nerding out on coffee and, the funny thing is, is once you kind of start peeling the onion, the more complex it gets, the more interesting it gets, and it never really ends because you can talk about sourcing, you can talk about the different types, you can talk about the qualities. You, there's all these different things in coffee that are really interesting. And I always knew I was going to come back to coffee. I always knew it. My wife had a coffee shop in Denver for a long time. And you know, I had pinned my first profile, which is just black, in 2008 off a small one pound fluid bed coffee roaster in Colorado. Super and racist. But. Yeah. Yeah. Just black. But that was in the reason. <laughs> so many things I want to say right now. The reason <laughs> but I won't, 
the reason, and, and I have to explain this to people all the time where I'm like, I, that was my everyday carry. The rifle in the front of the bag, yeah. just black was my, the service rifle. So when I came up with these things, I wasn't like going to, you know, brand, you know, all these different, you know, agencies or whatever. It was like me roasting coffee in my little 500 square foot, foot place in Colorado to take with me. And then in 2010, I was in Afghanistan. So I was using the AK a lot. Like I was training the dudes to use AK. Like I was just like, that's what I was doing. So then I developed AK 47 espresso because that's what I was using all the time. And people are like the lady protesting at the store that I would ask you that. Yeah. Because she, she came back again and we, we chatted again. Really? She did. Yeah. What happened? She, he had a protester in the coffee shop. Protester at the coffee shop twice now. And her, uh, her issue with the coffee shop is, is that we sell a, a blend of espresso called AK 47, which in her mind is our organization promoting uh, gun violence via the use of the AK. Has an AK ever been used in an active shooting? Yes, I looked all of this up so I could have a more education. <laughs> really? Which one, like a mass shooting? Uh, I know Hollywood, it was used in Hollywood. Not a shooting. Um, there mm-hmm. have been, it's about four or five, depending on how far mm-hmm. you go back at it and what you define as a mass shooting. But I, you know, one of the questions I had for us, in, and it wasn't trying to be a dick, and I literally, the first time we had an interaction, I'll be honest, it was... <sighs> It was less than professional. I deviated from some of my <laughs> philosophies that I, I talked about. We have a book to write, Andy. Jesus. I explored some of the depth of my uh, vernacular when it came to offensive language yeah. and thoughts about her beliefs. After that, I was like, God, I'm an idiot. And, and she I, came back she did. after that ass chewing. Wow. She actually, in, uh, she, I think it enticed her to come back because she got a reaction. Oh. Um, I was hoping that she would because I wanted to talk to her. And the second time, I ended up talking to her for like 45 minutes. And it was more, I opened with, hey. You should have podcasted her. That would have been great. I actually have considered that. It would fall apart, though, because what I've come to understand is that her beliefs are not based in actual... Truth? Well, logic. They're emotionally based. Mm. And, I'm, and, I don't, and I don't say that negatively, but under scrutiny, they're not going to bend. They're going to break and fall apart. And then it would go back to... Her screaming at me like she did the first time, telling me that I'm a, uh, what was it, a gun lusting bootlicker in oh, Magistan. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's cool. But I opened the second yeah. conversation with, like, listen, hey, I actually would like to talk with you if you'd answer a few questions because I want to develop a better understanding of what you believe so I can at least, you know, like understand why that you're out here. And also, I understand that you have the right to be here. First Amendment exists for everybody. So I've already told the staff, like, let you be. Um, did she buy coffee? No. Somebody actually gave her one of your coffees. Yeah. Or one of your waters. Yeah. And she thought I was like messing with her. She's like, this isn't like a AK-47 water, is it? I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> but what I, I'm glad that I ended up talking with her. She has been yeah. protesting for 30 years. So this right. is so oh, she's an activist. Yeah. She is an activist. And I don't have any problem with that. And I was, yeah, and I was, you. and I was asking questions because, you know, she, her, the AK, it's like, it's, it's in her mind. And I asked her, because I realized after the first interaction, yeah, it says that on a bag of coffee, but where I live, you can go buy an AK at a variety of stores. And I said to her, I was like, do you know, I understand, I, I understand that you believe what you believe, and I know that I'm not going to be able to change your mind. I just have some questions so I can understand and develop a better space for who you are and what you believe. And, you know, maybe at the end of the day, we're not going to agree, and I'm totally fine with that, and you're welcome to be out here, but... If the AKs are your issue, have you ever thought about actually going and protesting at a place where you can buy AKs? And she's like, yeah, I've thought about that, but I don't feel safe there. I feel safe here. I'm like, cool. cool. Okay. Wow. Very interesting. She's, yeah. and, you know, it, it got interesting. She's like, you know, if you get shot by an AK, it obliterates you and you're really? not recognizable. Did, I was like, did you well, tell her? Here's I, a fun fact. Here's a fun fact. <laughs> From about all 15 feet away, I took one of those and yet I'm still here. So how does that align with your logic? She's like, well, you're one of the lucky ones. I'm like, on this, we agree. <laughs> you know? yeah. it, it, it's, I would never change her opinion. Um, I would never be able to. And honestly, like, you can look at it two ways. You could be like, I want to get a bulldozer and drive mm-hmm. this person over. Or how fucking beautiful is it that you can stand on the street corner and tell people whatever you want to. And the law can't do shit about it. Mm-hmm. We're so lucky to live in a place where that can actually happen True. versus places that we have spent years of our life where they're like, 
can I talk to you real fast on the roof yeah. of this building? Yeah. I just want to check and see if gravity still works. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you know? It's true. It's a gravity checker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, take, I'll take somebody screaming in my face something that I don't agree with over living in a place where I'm going to lop your head off and stay in the concrete red because you have an, uh, an opinion that's different. Yeah, I, I think everybody who has these opinions, who it becomes their persona, because yeah. a lot of them, like the 30-year thing, this is her identity. Mm -hmm. she, so she's a school teacher. Yeah. And uh, she said that she spends, um, she was said she was going to come back again at some other time. I'm like, you know, feel free to. I've already told the staff, like, you're more than welcome to be out there. You're on public property. And she said, well, I won't be back in the summer because every day in the summer I stand on the courthouse steps with a sign about gun violence. And at that point, I'm like, okay, I understand who you are and what mm -hmm. your belief system is. And this is what you do. Like you said, it becomes their identity. Yeah. To nothing but respect. Yeah, for, it's for that. I may not agree with your message, which I don't. Um, and, I, and I wish I could. I wish the only thing I wish in those environments is that you could bridge the gap between emotion and logic a little mm. bit and leave them with that. And they could cross the bridge if they want to. But they, the people that I have encountered like that will not let you build a bridge because no. they're not actually interested in moving. Yeah, and that's OK. No, you know, yeah, it's like the sex versus gender. It's like, you know, this whole debate over a what is a social construct of, of gender identity where now you have, you know, Z and all these additional things because people lack purpose. So they're just making shit up. I mean, like you're making things up, but We're I get really going to trend on this podcast. Well, I, I, so let's just go there. <laughs> I, well, I want to get your opinion. The, the reason I'm bringing it up because I want to get your opinion on, because two profound things just happened in Montana including an activist on the oh, floor yeah. of Montana and Bozeman getting shut down. One, like the, the narrative that was spit on the left side didn't actually articulate why she got shut down. I mean, she was interrupting and disrupting the entire chamber of their ability to do any legislation and they banned her. And then everybody was like, well, now they're transphobic, which is the immediate default. Like if I say something like, I don't agree. I think transgender people have a mental health dilemma. There are exceptions and gender dysphoria. There are exceptions, including genetic mutations and anomalies that exist at birth that are that, that happen. In fact, I, I likely have somebody in my family who falls into that category. So I do understand that. But the idea that a man could say he's a woman and then now society says you're definitively a woman I take issue with that. And for you guys out of Idaho and Montana, conservative areas of our country. What'd you scoop out of there? My what did you just eat? <laughs> oh. Like, do I have something? I was like, is there ground? <laughs> is there chocolate at the bottom yeah. of that? Um, I, I, I want your opinion because you, you yeah. both have kids. And the biggest issue for me is the idea of transitioning children, which I cannot fathom in our world. Yeah in our country that that's legal, and it is. In fact, Washington State, with the Bill 5599, just declared that if a child seeks refuge in a youth shelter or program, they could transition through the state without their parents, parents' permission, obviously facilitating people who are abused, children who are abused, but literally giving a loophole mm. for children to seek transition without the parents' consent or even notification. So they don't even have to know. The, the old law was you had 48 to 72 hours to notify the parent or guardian that your child had just ran away and sought, sought refuge in a, in a state um, area. Now that doesn't exist. And so when you look at the, the things that you can get done, everything from penile implantation to literally getting your balls chopped off. And so um, I'm interested in what you guys' opinion on it because it is controversial, but... Um, inquiring minds want to know. I, this I one's imagine. easy for me. You want me to go first? Yeah. Like I, I, at a baseline level, I truly want people to live like a happy life. Hundred percent. I want them to I be agree. fulfilled. Yeah. And I'm not here to uh, police anybody's belief. And I do, like, in the very few transgender people that I have had a direct interaction with, which there haven't actually been that many. It's also almost an issue of what you talked about, things you see online versus you see in real life. Or maybe I didn't even fucking know, right? I'll throw that out there as well. But in the ones that I have talked to, I believe I believe them when they tell me what they believe. Yeah. However, I reject their ideology. 
Mm-hmm. I, I believe that a man, it's possible that they could feel like they are a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body. I believe people when they say that. I reject the ideology that a man can become a woman. Like, it is not, I'm sorry, it, from the science and my understanding of science, there is not a fucking shred of science that shows that you can go from an XX to an XY or the other direction. If we take, if we were to, I don't, I don't even know how to say this without it being a fucking soundbite pulled out and used another way, but if we were to have an island and on the island were women <laughs> and trans- An island, huh? <laughs> And it's like, okay. A tranny so, island? Is that what you're trying to say? That's what I'm saying. Like, and somebody will fucking I'm in. cut it right there. And it's just like, <laughs> he said, put him. And it's like, that's not what I'm saying. An isolated area where there was women and transgender men. Our fucking species ends. It is the end of the fucking species. It's not right. possible for Very it to Very good continue. point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The ideology is at any time that somebody voices this, that we have to believe them. And I've asked this of of people who are advocates of allowing children to make those choices, I'll generally default to if an eight year old came to you and said they wanted to tattoo a word on their forehead, would you let them? And the answer for most people, if not everybody is like, fuck no. Should we let an eight year old vote in our presidential election? People are like, no, absolutely not. And if you dig into the why, why can't they make that decision? Or if you view that through the lens of any other decision, it seems like in the modern scope of it, if you leave out the gender identity but ask it in a different direction, everybody's like, no, they're not old enough to make that call. Like, how the fuck can you be old enough then to decide to cut your penis off? Mm. Like, I don't, that's what I'm saying. Like, I do believe people when they tell me, like, this is what I believe. I'm like, cool. I don't agree with your ideology, and I don't think that makes me bigoted in any way. I don't understand it. From the, the data that I have seen, it doesn't make any sense to me. I am not going to try to inhibit your ability to live a life the way that you want to in any way, shape, or form, but I will not participate in what I consider to be a charade. Mm-hmm. I won't do it. I I really don't have a... I don't have a lot to add to this outside of, like, I, I think, you know, it, it's fairly simple, right? It's I think from a scientific perspective, the brain finishes its development roughly around 24 to 26. For men at least. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and it varies specifically related to male or female. Um, You know, I think if you participate in this, this, whatever this is, um, you know, it's, it's voluntarily, I mean, it's, you're voluntarily sending your kids into a system that might, might be pro or con, whatever that is. But at the end of the day, for me, and I know this is really kind of a non-answer, but it's like, I'm just not going to participate in it. Like my kids aren't going to participate in it. I'm not going to participate in it. I'm very much a libertarian from a certain perspective, specifically around social issues, not necessarily all economic issues. I get very edgy when people try to tell me that I have to believe what they believe. I don't, I don't like it when anyone tells me that I have to participate in something specifically with social issues yep. regarding my family or my individual rights. I get really, I, I get very skeptical because I'm very much a live and let live. If I don't interfere with your life, you can't interfere with mine. Like it's my, you know, it's my right to live, you know, the, the life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And it's someone else's too. So if they want to participate in that, that's great. I'm just not going to. And I, I kind of check out of the entire conversation because I just think it's nonsense, like all the way around, right? It's like, like it's, a, it's a colossal waste of time would unless you it affects in, my... I was going to say, would you check into it if your daughters had to compete in sports against men? Um, yes and, and no. I mean, I think, I, think there are certain, I think there are certain aspects of athletics that if you're, if you're opting in specifically as, as children, then you can participate on equal footing regardless. And I think that in some ways that's good, in some ways it's bad, right? Creating a firewall between uh, genders in sports, but then removing that firewall when it's okay. Like, so I, I guess what I'm going with is like, the, the government can't have this like, straight up double standard and everything they do it's okay in certain ways and it's Mm -hmm. not okay in other ways so in california i think they wanted to pass a piece of legislation where you uh, and i don't know if they did or if they were considering it where you had to have a trans person and in a and a lgbtq rstuv 
uh, on your board of directors of your company. And so hmm. I guess, so we're, we're, we're equal, but we're not. So it, it's, there's this like forced equalization specifically coming out of like state or federal regulations, which I don't agree with in any capacity. So I can't really say I agree with no, uh, you know, what I would say is, is uh, uh, gender um, categorization in some ways, but then I do in other ways, right? So it's it becomes a, a, an interesting philosophical question when you start categorizing it, when it's okay in some ways and not okay in other ways, where you're like, there should be zero relationship between what I think your sexual identity and your gender and the way that you're actually hired specifically related to your professional workforce environment. Mm -hmm. But then there should be a separation when we call, you know, athletics, which I completely agree with the physical circumstance. It also differentiates, but in some professions, there is a physical circumstance where you do the, you know, I mean, based on, on what you're doing, you, the, you're, your strength matters and what you bring professionally to the table. So, it, you know, the NFL is a good, good one. Like if they, if they forced, you know, an equal uh, categorization of gender, so it became 50, 50 male, female, how would that change the face of football, baseball, basketball, literally everything. Uh, but how is that okay in the professional workforce outside of that? It's okay in athletics, but it's, it, it, it's not okay in athletics, but, it's okay in the corporate environment. Do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. Where it's like, so are we only separating the differences between male and female based on intellectual capacity? But in some ways we are in the physical capacity. So th the point of this is, this is a really long philosophical debate that I think is interesting as far as like a thought exercise. But like I've got two beautiful amazing kids at home, six and nine, like they're incredible, incredible kids. If I don't like their school and I know that I'm fortunate in this regard, I'm going to pull them out of the school. I'm yeah. going to homeschool them. Like that's what I'm going to do. And my issue is more the, I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any stretch of the imagination. I worry women have fought very hard for a level playing field in correct. athletics. And it, in my opinion, which is all it fucking counts for, is I think it has to be protected at all costs. And I don't want to see an unlevel playing field because of a social ideology. And have, like, it, it's the issue that the only way that I think to protect it, though, is to women to stand up for themselves. Like, the three of us sitting at this table, like, men cannot save women's sports, but if we're not careful, they're, they're going to ruin it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I I couldn't agree more. I think like like personally and emotionally, right? It's like I would get very invested in this specifically with my kids. Um, and I think about it, it's like, I, I really do think that what, from women's sports and you know, women's rights, to your point, like they've worked very hard to get to where they are. And then to see that, I guess, that progress be deteriorated based on men that are identifying as women specifically related to a, a sport. Like, I think that's disingenuous at best. And I think it ultimately takes away from all of the hard work around it. But then again, the fuck am I? Like, what are you looking at on your phone, Mike? He's I was there. texting Jose to get more coffee. Oh, Kim? that's how good I am, Kim. Yeah, like, are you talking? Kim, are you talking sorry. about Kim? His cover it. name. I don't I even know who Jose. this. I don't even know who this guy. His call signs Jose. Figured he was googling like pictures of hog legs. Yeah, <laughs> he's like, he's like, uh, who was the main character in uh, Harry Potter uh, season four? Like, <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck are you doing? He's fucking Hogwarts. You j that is the longest bullshit answer. Like you, that was very. Um, what is it called? The bullshit answer. He gave a CEO answer. That's not such a it's, CEO it's, fucking it's, answer. It's, it's what would a, what would I Staff Sergeant guys, Hafer say? I want you in the guys fucking to know that invasion. the answer is both yes and no. I, it's it's not because we're it's, a TMB it's, together I'm doing the invasion, pushing through Iraq, and I'm like Evan, what do you think about these fucking trans, bro? I, the answer really would be, I don't fucking care. <laughs> yeah, that's like, the honestly, true. That, I don't yeah, fucking that's care. True. Like, yeah. I, I really don't. That's like, true. Like, I don't care until it bumps up against 
other people. I Same. don't care. If it comes I, into Utah, it's I'm caring. I We're don't burn this motherfucker down. Like I, you I, are going to be labeled as a domestic terrorist like, again I, for saying yeah. that. Well, I, like here's the thing: figuratively, like, <laughs> burn it down <laughs> with legislation. If it if it affects my life, if I'm being forced into something like yeah. like it goes back to the whole thing around like I, I don't want to continue to bring up like mask, no mask, or whatever it is, but it's like the dumb shit that we're talking about opera mask here or COVID or, mask. COVID mask. Okay. So it's like <laughs> the dumb shit that local national or local state and national governments were imposing on people that were oh, impeding God. on their individual liberties was unacceptable. We've already forgotten. Like we've already forgotten about it. And I think any time you, you capitulate your individual liberty to morons, we have a problem. So you, we shouldn't be forced to participate in quite literally anything. If Montana it does, it was one of the worst states about that too. Really, dude, we were so locked down, we couldn't do anything. Utah was. Are you wide fucking open with me? <laughs> oh, yeah, dude, Montana was like the worst. <laughs> He's such a fucking liar. Oh my god! Such I was like, liar. wait, I see like, that. Dude, thing. I went. Okay. I went. So here's a great story. I went back to Portland. <laughs> for How SEA. was that? I was going to ask you. I oh, to, bro! Thank God like, you brought that back up. Like, it, I thought I was back in COVID. Really? Yeah, I was like, dude, did I take a time machine? Is this is this fucking Dude's wearing masks? aircraft went went back through the Bermuda Triangle and put me back in the fucking COVID era? Like, dude, the amount of like what top knot people do you think? It was had to be twenty plus percent. What? What do you think wearing a mask still means to those people? Is it do they do you think oh, at the end of the God. day they deeply believe that they are doing the right thing protecting others? No fuck. This is I think it's a it's a form of uh um what do they what do they call that? The the political posturing or what do they call virtue those? signaling? Yeah, virtue signaling, right? It's like, you know, I'm more woke than you are because I've got like purple hair and a top knot and, and a mask. you know twelve twelve rings in my nose and I've got a fucking mask now, right? It's like, okay, cool. Half of them we're still wearing is in like chin diapers. They're not even really wearing them. It's like it's like some type of like strange fashion for I think twenty somethings to participate in the political conversation outwardly. Most of this is just how much attention can you bring to yourself about nonsense? And I think young Oh, well, I sound like I'm like 80 years old now. Young people. Um, yeah, I mean, th we are old as fuck. We're searching, getting old. Yeah, we are. Like, they're they're right searching now. for 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 a way to communicate outwardly, right? Like with their dress or whatever it might be. It's the same thing, like to a certain degree. If you think about like back in the day, like how old are you, 46? Five. 45. How old are you? So, 46. How old are so, you, Mike? 43. I, it's tough with Asians. I could say somewhere between twenty to seventy. Yeah, yeah. it's like it when we matter. hit seventy-one, we're fucked. Yeah, we turn into fucked. like the crypt keeper. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're like Mr. <laughs> you're straight up Mister Miyagi. Yeah. That, like, oh, it's like yes. straight up. You, yes, I, I may or may not have played around with AI a little bit and aging Mike. But yeah, you will look Ooh. exactly like Mister Miyagi. Oh yes, that does. Yeah. That does. Yes, strike. yeah. I love AI. But Let's it, not get on that. If you think about it, like like. Like Bosworth back in the day, right? Seattle Seahawks, and he's shaved those steps in the side of his head. You remember that? Are we still talking about this? Yeah, dude. If you think about, <laughs> if you think about like like shaving your steps or like side strikes, spiking your hair with like the Mullet. the the Tony Hawk. You remember like the Ooh, Tony yeah. Hawk, the flip that went all the way. Yeah, down. yeah, yeah. Very emo. Like, That's the terminology. Yeah, but but back in the day, dude, like we we're wearing like spandex, side spiked hair, like steps. Cut in the side of your. You remember this shit, yeah, right? With yeah, with trimmed eyebrow, like yeah, you like accidentally yeah, and then, vanilla ice. But it was legit. Oh, God. I think Neither part of it is just like that shit. No, I didn't. You probably I was didn't, a loser. You I probably did. Not. Didn't. I was a dork. Mm. I was I a dork. I would use past tense on that, but I did. I had, I had, I had, I had the steps. I had did the you steps. really? Yeah, man. Racing stripes. I had the steps on the side of the. Where, what were you? Were you like a skater kid, or you like a? Yeah. How many yeah. of you pegged river rats? Huh? Did you guys ever peg your jeans? Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. What's that? Pegging your pants where you fold, you like you fold them take in. Take the slack out, fold it over, and then roll it up. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, dude, that was like that. an eighties. That, that, that trend? was a total eighties. You thing. did that? <laughs> yeah. I had an older sister. She was like six years older than yeah, I yeah. was. So I, I kind of got co-opted into the the style that was a little bit before oh. my time. MC Hammer pants. Yeah. And I yes, I remember those. 
They're at Kmart. I wanted some. I wish I had some. They're at Kmart. I, I really wish. Was it like Zubaz or something like that? You remember that? Yeah, that, I think that was Zubaz, the name. yeah. Yeah, that was the name. Um, but no, I, I think 90% of the time you would have uh, uh, found me in probably a Pal Peralta shirt. Uh, Same. With, that was, uh, that's where I was with, with some type dork. of skater haircut. And yeah. uh, that was kind of the... I had a rat tail and shit. Never had one. I had a rat tail. Never, yeah. never had one. Never yeah. did a mullet. Did a rat tail, though. Yeah, never did a mullet. Never did a rat tail. Just had the side swoop thing. My middle son has a mullet that. right now. It's fantastic. Oh, I saw man. that recently. I call him Deb. Because I was like, dude, if I get you a Subaru and you, you would like, <laughs> not, you wouldn't be able yeah. to stop going to a softball yeah, you, game because you look like a lesbian. You, yeah, you're you're going to start work at the um, lumber yard. Do you still want to do those uh, bumper stickers we talked about? Yeah, it absolutely. says lesbians are disorganized. <laughs> <laughs> Just to see what people like, huh? Wh- wh- why 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 does that exist? You know, like yeah. uh, like that's that's my main job now is to create things that are people like. Why does that thing exist? Why yeah. what is that? I'm trying to transition into leadership. Okay, yeah, yeah. There's not a good, please, please please not a good jumping point. No, no. no. We're waiting. I'm, wait, I'm just giving you <laughs> that warno. So I'm looking yeah, for yeah. the jumping Transition, point. Transition, uh, I'll go take a piss. All right, let's talk about leadership because we, yeah. we have... Like shorts. Hike those up for the camera. That's what I'm talking dork. about. Dork. Um, I got to get this seat. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. yeah. Th- this house is built for midgets, so you're you're right in there. That have you ever peed in the sink? Funny. Huh? Have you ever peed in the sink? I've peed in multiple sinks. Yeah. In Iraq, I think that's literally all I did was penis. I was trying to explain to Leah. She's talking about the, like this arduous situation for women. Yeah. Like, oh, we have to wait for the stall. I'm like, if there's a sink available, I'm not pissing in the sink. Shit. I'm porcelain. It's porcelain. You know. There goes the transition for leadership. Yeah. I, I thought I was there. We can't. We got to let's back up a little. Or just want to just go into it. I'm not editing this. Why would you? Uh, I know. You, yeah. We're yeah. doing a book. We're doing a book on leadership. I thought we were going to talk about leadership. You're just always trying to sell stuff. <laughs> Fuck, you can't put that on here, man. <laughs> Everybody's going to be like, see? Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. We're not selling shit. We're giving it away what's for our, free. What's our book going to be called? Buy My Shit <laughs> by Mike Glover. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. God. Am I wearing, I'm not wearing any black rifle. Oh, what is this? No, you're not going to wear any of your friend's brands because you fucking... What, what is this? This is a cleared hot hat. Yeah, it's really a cleared hot hat. <laughs> Go ahead and zoom in to the logo on that, which is... Probably some I, cattle ranch. Where'd you get that bag from? That's my bag. No, I I bet Evan brought that. He did bring it. We brought it. Yeah. We actually brought it. Did we bring that? Okay. Nobody knows that. where it came from. That shit sells out fast. Does it? Yeah. How's it doing right now? Well. Because it was out of stock for. It was out of stock for a while. I used to oh. sell it, but then I don't have the ability to anymore. So just go to your normal blackriflecoffee.com website. You're not selling them in your store? Uh, we're trying to get a hold of some to sell into the store. I get asked about it every day, but it's it's controlled now by Black Rifle. Can't you do a different bag? Can, do you have the luxury of doing different bags? I don't know. There I, should be a stipulation. Like maybe, but I don't know the mechanisms of doing that. Oh, Evan's back, so let's not yeah. talk about that anymore. There's a mechanism. You just got to make one. No, no, I don't want to do that. Evan makes the coffee bags. That's what I do. Who Who's making bags right now? What are you talking about? No, I mean, he also claimed that's a fucking cleared hot hat. It, I just called it. Clear, <laughs> we literally just. This is the new cleared hot hat. You guys can get them in the link down below. <laughs> He's like, I always support my friends' brands, and he looks at me like, I'm, I'm not wearing any black rifle. Yeah, wearing black rifle like underwear a, right now. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, he does though. What, who makes the bags? I've like never seen you in a Phil Craft fucking anything. Uh, do you, you know why? Do you know why? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to know why? I do. Because whatever shirt size you have like whatever shirt you're using <laughs> i'm at, i'm in between oh, the medium the and the large it's medium. It's medium yeah so we don't make mediums so like, no you do Nobody but does. it's like for whatever reason i because i think you're using a 60 40 you're not using, we're using 60 40, yeah you're so. using a 60 40 so i'm in between the medium and the large uh-huh. and so the large is too big the medium is too small what about hats that's why you've only given me like one I have the I have I have the See? Tiger Stripe Fieldcraft Survival hat with with the mesh back. That's the only one that I have. That's like a life. limited. Do you know hat? how I get my Fieldcraft Survival stuff? I go to my fucking coffee shop and buy it off the fucking tower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Evan could do that as well. I yeah. I, they're like in six of them. Did he tell you the title of his new book? It's called "I'm Mike Glover Buy My Shit." <laughs> <laughs> Supposedly, I, I'm a seller. Hey, well, you know what? You know what you should do is you should just let me design something for you, and then eventually, like all all. I'll wear it. How is your heart rate at 63 right now? I'm sweating fucking bullets right now. I because got that ketone. What is that ketone ester called? Like, yeah. Jeff Wood shit. doesn't taste yeah. good. Yeah, it's, I mean, Ethanol. it's good. 
It's freaking Whatever awesome. Whatever it is, it's really good. And the coffee, so it's like, and you're at 63. I'll, I'll actually... Cardio machine. I'll actually, I'll, I'll design something for you just so I can wear it. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck I'll do that. that I'll do that. Nice. Yeah. You know why? You know why I never, never wear anything, Phil Craft? Why? I'll set you up with a licensing agreement. It's not. It's <laughs> <laughs> because, because you're never, you're never around. That's why. I'm as always because I'm because in my office, if you were to go ask anybody in the office to say, "Hey, is everyone wear wear anything Phil Craft?" They'd be like, "Yeah, probably like I don't know, right. once every other week." I have like a hundred shirts once in my every fucking, other week, so that's twice, twice a, month. a month. Twice a month. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Which because is times more than you ever wear anything clear hot. I, I wish I could get anything clear hot because it's always sold out. Well, part somebody does limited so that's, quantities. That's what it sounds like when limited somebody, quantities. When to, somebody lies to your face, that's what it sounds create like. Create right scarcity now. in the market. That's what yeah. he said. He said that, guys. He was going to do that on purpose. Yeah, it's limited FOMO. runs. Fear, fear of missing out. It's called FOMO. It's really God. good. Yeah. Attack my front. Let's get, that's a good leadership segue. What? Fear I don't of know. Missing out? No, it's. I think it's time for leadership. What is I, it? I, I what do you want to talk about? I want some leadership God, advice from you guys. Structured regimented approach to this Black Rifle Coffee podcast. Fuck, dude! It's uh, the so prep life, like free, cleared hot, free black rifle podcast. Creativity, leadership. Let's go. Leadership, leadership. Let's yeah. go. Give me your, give me your. Who is the best leader? And then we'll talk about the worst leader. Who's the mm. best leader that you ever met in your military career? He's not a public facing person, so I'm not going to give the name. But I have a specific example in my first interaction. Did I meet him? Was he at the wedding? No. Okay. Uh, the first interaction I had with him, he was an E7 at the time. So it was a senior enlisted leader that mm. had probably the most impactful uh, course correction on my thoughts on leadership and my desire to try to replicate um, just about everything from like uh, tone of voice, speech patterns, the way really? he held himself, conducted himself, thought through problems. Yeah. Was he? Was this a damn neck or before? Yeah, it was a damn neck, my first team leader. Is he still there or did he retire? Nope. He I'll fill you, you, you guys might know who he is. I'll fill you in offline. I don't want to mm -hmm. get too much into the, He's just not a public facing person. I don't want to air him out. Yeah. But he re, he's retired. Correct. Mm -hmm. Interesting. E7. So he was a senior dude. That was my, he was a, he became a nine at, you know, by the end of it. But when I first met him, he was E7. I was an E5. Interesting. Really cool. Um, that would have been your troop sergeant major. Team leader. We Team, your TL. Yeah. We don't use terms like that in the Navy. Squadron. Oh. Yeah. Fleet. Fleet like, chief, yeah, fleet chief, boat chief, like boat boat seaman, boat seaman chief. Continue, <laughs> tell me more. <laughs> seaman chief. What about you, Boatswain's mate, the number one Flute leader. Puller. <laughs> oh, number one, man, that's tough because like there's there's actually been, I think, what what I've realized is like you have different people in different phases of your life that are that exemplify leadership that you emulate. But then you might move on to different types of, you know, professional development or different phases of your life. And, and maybe those leaders sometimes have dis been disappointing to me. Um, like you thought they were squared away and then you evolved and then you look back and you're like, oh, well, they weren't that great. Well, I mean, like, like, uh, like I've had really, really, really good combat leaders, like really good guys that like were very effective in combat, horrible family men. Yeah, train wreck. Hor like, yeah. oh, fucking point. horrible family men. Yeah, right. Or in garrison, they said. Oh, couldn't do an NCOER. No, good, no. Yeah. Like, could, could, like, couldn't put anybody in for anything ever. Like, like yeah. they, they were just, they were fucking horrible. But I mean, incredible. Like, they were the guy. Like, hey, man, you're in charge, right? Like, problem is, you spend two percent of your career in combat. Yeah. You got a guy who's basically a grenade with three quarters of the pin out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like. There are guys that are really good combat leaders. There are guys that are really good, I think, within, like, we'll call it the more garrison circumstance, mm -hmm. you know? And the, there, there are people, I think, that thrive in that environment. Yeah. And they're horrible combat leaders, mm -hmm. right? They're, so there's, like... So crazy. It's really hard to find somebody that's, like, incredible combat leader. It's a really good, what I would say is an administrator, you know, more of a... Uh, uh, you know, garrison leader, and then also is just an impeccable person on top of that. So they just have layers of depth and wisdom to the individual. Like it's, it's almost like non-existent to, to be fair. Because I don't you think can, you should actually look for one person. 
No. Huh. Because at the end of the day, we're all flawed because we're mm-hmm. talking about human beings. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think it's possible. Maybe there's some outlier mm-hmm. yeah. that has all those things. And if you, you know that person in your life, good for you. And you, if you dig enough, you could likely find may, the error. May, maybe, there's yeah. not, maybe there's one person out there who's not like that. But I think you should absorb what you can from who you can. Mm-hmm. Because if you put anybody on a pedestal, it, the, you're just... you're going to be disappointed at some point in time because they're a human being. Well, I, I think the question, I guess I'll rephrase the question then. It's it's who, what leader had the most impact on mm. you? Because I've had leaders certainly who are just in their own ways fucked up, but they, yeah. they, they profoundly, like you said, that senior chief. Well, don't forget that examples of really shitty leadership can be profound as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, the next question. I actually question. have learned a lot of leadership lessons by watching a fucking train wreck from a distance going, Oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. I actually think that really good leadership is harder to learn lessons from because it's harder to articulate the steps that Mm -hmm. they are taking to achieve what they are. Whereas a train wreck, you can kind of reverse engineer. I'm not going to be that guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't do what he does. Well, Well, yeah. When, when, when a, when a flight goes well, okay. You, you never, you, you never know who the pilot is. When a flight goes bad yeah. and somebody saves it, like you always know who it is, right? And I mean, there's there's like, and then maybe that's a horrible analogy, but I think I've actually learned, I think more, and that I've come to this conclusion is, is like there are peers that I look up to more so than I think command because command has been a little bit dis, disassociated at times. And, but my peers, I think, they've actually been a way better leadership example for me than I would say even the people that have been in positions of authority because I look at them as a pure set going, fuck, I want to yeah. want to be like that guy. Like The guy I was talking about bad was literally middle management. He was yeah. underneath the troop chief, who was underneath the troop O, who was underneath the squadron. Uh, like he was like, I don't know if you use it as a ladder. He was four rungs up of a ladder of ten. Did he walk mm-hmm. the rungs? Did, I mean, did Eventually he? Eventually over time. Because I, I know a, a commonality in especially our communities is a lot of times some of the best leaders identified by the men aren't always the guys who work the wrong, who, who actually make it. That's true in any system. I mean, people don't want to act like there's no bureaucracy in the special operations community. Fucking are you, who are you trying to lie to? Like, holy shit. Yeah. And it's a, it's a rock, paper, rank organization. If you're a great leader and you challenge a senior officer in public, you're going to get fucked. You're going to get bent over the table and fucked and your career might be over. It doesn't matter how much good of a leader the team might think you are. Right. So that you got to be, you got to be able to not only be a great leader, leader, but navigate through the system that you're working in until you can achieve that leadership position for influence. I've seen that happen so many times. Yeah. When you, when you, um, it's interesting because we, we had talked about this for the, for the book that we are eventually going to write about how your perspective and a lot of military perspectives are different than the narrative because the narrative leadership book is like follow the leadership path of the small unit yeah. or officer or the, the military leader. But your take on it's kind of the complete opposite of that. What 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 have you found to be different? <clears throat> so I opened with that, uh, the resilience seminar this weekend talking about leadership because that was my segment. And it was a shift a couple of years ago. I think I started realizing that, and you haven't been there when I've talked about this, Evan, but... I actually really advocate against. He's, he's never been there when we talk about this. He hasn't. He's never been. He's been invited. He was invited to this one. Yeah, he's probably just running a, a public company. You know, <laughs> Mike, so he's probably. Got stuff oh, I see how it's going. <laughs> I see what's happening here. <laughs> PhilCrassRobber dot com. Yeah, I I advocate for what organizations that bring me in to speak. I actually take the time up front to advocate for not replicating a military leadership model in a civilian organization, and. Sometimes they'll sit back in their chair and you can see like their eyebrows coming together like, well, what do you mean? We brought you in here because you're from the military. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not saying that there's not incredible lessons from that type of leadership, hmm. but let me talk to you about the community that I came from. I don't know. I probably volunteered eight times and went through two, two years of like crucible courses. So when I arrived at my team, I could not have been more bought in on right. the mission. Yeah. And I was also under contract for X number of years. Right. And so you could talk to me in a way that was super short, super truncated. You could use negative feedback, positive feedback. I was so bought in on wanting to be there and wanting to do that. What we did 
that you could have the worst fucking leadership possible and I'm still going to kill myself. Mm -hmm. To try to accomplish the goal, right? So if you try to replicate that shit at IBM, what a dude is like, and I know nothing about IBM. I've always used this example of that organization, even though I know nothing about it. The level of buy-in there is not comparable. It's if not. you just go around, and I'm sure you see this at Black Rifle, if you just were to go around, you will have people who are there for different reasons. You are going to have somebody working for you, like, dude. I'm just here for the every two week paycheck. I don't actually give a fuck about coffee. I don't give a fuck about this brand. This is the job that I could get so I can pay my bills. Mm -hmm. And other people who are like, this is, I love and live and breathe this. You cannot use the one hmm. approach fits all. Most people think military leadership is a very full metal jacket as well. Like, mm -hmm. just bah, 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 which is not that way. I think it's much more collaborative. Mm -hmm. But I have watched so many military people get out and try to lead the way they did in the military and fall flat on their fucking face. So yeah. true. Absolutely tripping over every obstacle, putting obstacles in front of them. And it's, you can learn the lessons, but you have got to learn how to separate yourself from that community of people. And I don't know if it's possible at a civilian organization to have the level of buy-in in the communities that we came from. I don't think it is because mm -hmm. of the level of pain and discomfort. Mm -hmm. And voluntarily showing up the next day over and over and over again. And maybe you're going to make it, maybe you're not. But when you do, I mean, they're literally like dragging you out of that community when you're done with it, right? Like people are still clawing to stay involved in that. I don't know if that's possible in the civilian world. I would be, I would love to see it and how they achieve that. But if you think you can take a military leader and then looking back, I've arrived at the decision that the easiest place to lead ever is in the military, specifically the communities we came from because of that buy-in. You cannot just take somebody who was a leader in that community, drop them at IBM and think they're going to do great mm -hmm. things. They actually might drive everybody away. Well, you've seen it direct. I mean, with a turnover average in the United States now, 20 plus percent, like mm -hmm. in every company. Yeah. As an average, have you been able to, to take a lot of that or is it just a different game completely? Especially with a public company, which is a lot of fucking people. Yeah, it's a lot of people. Um, you know, I think... It, like truly understanding the difference, you know, in, in the corporate environment, there's a, there's a big difference between leadership and management, right? So, you know, understanding that good leaders need management skills and you can curate those management skills, right? Now, good managers don't make good leaders and vice versa, right? So how would you uh, define the difference between the two managing and leading? Uh, well, Leadership takes wisdom and wisdom from my perspective is a combination of experience. So you have your reps in under you, you have the intellectual capacity in order to accomplish it. So you have experience, intellectual capacity, which boils down to IQ. You have a formal education or some type of education within that background. You have the means in order to communicate all of those things effectively, right? So that's the way I kind of associate wisdom, which directly correlates with leadership because if you if you have the three components without one you actually need one of those components if you if you have three but you don't have the means in order to communicate well you won't be able to lead just plain and simply so uh, you might be really smart you might have a ton of reps you might have a formal education you might have everything but if you can't communicate that effectively to your subordinates or your peers or up you can't do it period and then, you, you know, I would say that there's another key component to this, which is you, you have to have the, the correct ethics, ethics and morals associated with uh, being able to not only take all of that wisdom and then be able to directly attribute to success of the organization. So that's kind of the key components from my perspective. Then when you separate that out and you say management, Management is more about making sure the administrative process and procedures are performed so you can do proper functions checks directly related to key performance indicators, right? That's management. It's, it's, it's just kind of the blocking and tackling of how a business operates. And you can have a, you can have a good manager, but that doesn't have great leadership and they're going to top out. Like basically they're, they're going to top out because they don't have the ability to move to the next level. You can have really good managers that continue to move up because of how good they are because they're exceptional managers, but they're really bad leaders, right? They're, they could be really good at the administrative, the process, the ability to kind of navigate data and, and push essentially numbers around. 
Uh, but all of those people eventually get blown out. Like when you have long-term steady hand, really good, what I would say is executive leaders, that's when you have the two. When you have those two key components of leadership and management and when, what we call it, it's a nine box drill, right? It's nine boxes uh, when you are essentially exceptional in all categories. That's what makes an incredible executive leader, manager, an executive. Um, and those, those are important, I think, and, and there's more key components specifically related to, I would say, just the thought of leadership and management in general, but that's kind of the basics of the way that I boil it down. Um, it's difficult because you also have wise managers that are capable of leading for finite amounts of time that are also really me driven. So there's missions and there's me's, right? So then you have another key crucial component. Are you in this for yourself or are you in this for your organization? And, uh, you know, we saw that in the military. I mean, I was distinctly aware of it early on because there were really guys that were just so concerned with a fucking stupid hat and not concerned with the mission of doing what it, what we were doing. Like when you're, you know, doing what Mike, Mike and I were, 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 you know, the main mission set was unconventional warfare, you know, like pinnacle of which being by, with, and through, which would be covert action. You know, that's a very specific responsibility that requires a, a, a set of skills and tool sets that are ba based on force multiplying, right? So you have to really want to love living in those circumstances and you had a lot of guys that were they they wanted to be you guys right they wanted to be unilateral direct action guys i'm like but that's a different fucking unit we focus on like, hydrographic reconnaissance <laughs> it's like it's a fucking it's a fucking <laughs> different <laughs> it's a different unit hydrologist it's a, it's a different mission it's yeah. a different unit and uh or they you know maybe they got pushed around when they were in fourth grade and they wanted to prove to everybody that they were real badass. So if they got this like fuzzy green hat, they were really cool. Uh, and they essentially got a really shiny ring with Deo Presso Labor and a, and a cool new hat. And then it was over for them. They're it's done. A it's a dope painting hat. Huh? It's a dope painting It hat. is, right? So I think those are the me's. The guys that are, you know, mission are like, they're less concerned with the headgear and more concerned with the results. Yep. And that's that's a very distinct difference like you know i think i i re, i i have to write mission statements for everything i do like i have to i have to understand the who what when where why i have to understand the bigger picture directly related to anything that i'm doing that's to include the the basics like you know being a father being a husband you know, being a, a, a CEO, being whatever it is, like I have to actually clarify those things for myself because uh, one, I, I, I'm not, um, I, I don't really have the, I, I can try to think selfishly. Like I can go through the thought exercise and try to like go through the thought exercise and saying, this is what's best for Evan. But most of the time I have to try and balance out what, what, what I'm doing to make sure that I'm not completely defaulted to the mission. Like I have to. And the other thing with that is like finding other people that are like you in an organization when you're recruiting, hiring and pulling people in, because you can have organizations, which I think there's probably a lot of those people in organizations like hedge funds or, and I'm just using that as an example that are fucking me's that are in it for what I would say is wealth and status yeah. because they want to be able to, to increase their title and increase their bank account. They're, they could give a shit less what they're doing. If they, if, if they got paid millions of dollars to, to, you know, uh, name the shittiest job on the planet, they would do that. It wouldn't fucking matter. Right. It, they're in it for the money. So, you know, I'm a capitalist is what is a super important distinction too from business. Like I like investing in building and I'm less concerned with the individual wealth outcome. I'm more concerned with how does it directly affect the success, health and longevity of the business. And I will always default to that. Always. Do you like being a CEO? 
their days. <laughs> <laughs> their days. Yeah. yeah, their days. Is it what you thought it would be? Uh, it's a it's it's a lot more. Yeah, it's it's way more. It's 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 the hardest job I've ever had in my life. Like by by far, it's it stretches my ability to learn. I, it would be. It, I think about this all the time. I would love to have a brain scan of what my brain looked like 10 years ago and what it looks like today. Um, Cause there's zero doubt as to the repetition and the learning that I've had to, to, to put it to, to essentially like what I tell people is like, dude, I'm redlining this fucking gray matter every day. Like yeah, I, I am redlining it because yeah. you know, I, I, I definitely don't consider myself the smartest guy in the room ever, like n- not even close. And I, and I'm not just saying that to like sound cool. I fucking don't. So it's like, I got to get everything that I can out of this. And I've thought about this a lot where it's like, even if we all go all the way back to, you know, 19, 20 years old, you know, like, you know, I'm five, seven, you know, 155 pounds on my best day going through selection or anything else. Like, it's not like anything has ever been gifted to me from an athletic or intellectual capability. You know, I've had those gifts obviously because I have all my fingers and toes and I can count to 10 and that's awesome. But everything about my entire life has been how hard can I push this fucking machine to get as much as I can out of it. And there's never a break. Like I I don't like, like, cause I, I would love to have been born with a bigger brain, maybe a bigger dick. I don't fucking know. That would have been awesome. Like a there. huge old hog and a giant <laughs> brain. <laughs> but basically Mike Glover. Yeah. Like basically, you know, it's a tough but wife. <laughs> nothing's, nothing's easy. And like, it, and I don't want it to be, to be fair. Like, I mean, what fun is it if you're just like gifted everything in life, you'd be like a fucking trust. It just wouldn't have any meaning either. It would have no meaning. Like it's like people who are gifted with like, great genetic gifts. Like they're a lot like trust fund kids. They don't know how to fucking work. Like they don't know how to work. So the answer to that question without going on an even longer diatribe is like, there are days when I like it. Most days are, I find fulfillment in the fact that like I leave going, fuck, I did it. I did, I did everything I could today. Didn't, didn't leave any, didn't leave anything on the, on the field, man. Yeah. <laughs> I don't leave anything on the field. What else you want to talk about, Mike? Yeah, what do you got? Well, we were talking about um, good leadership. I'm, I'm interested because, I mean, it's it's probably we'll go down a rabbit hole because you didn't seen, answer your own question. Dude. I don't need to answer it. You guys shut the fuck up. Expertise, I, dude. You guys Wait, got so much. Shut. The what fuck was the up. question? <laughs> you, you asked it. You asked it. What was it? Best leader. Like, best leader. Um, uh, best leader. Um, same answer. I got combat leaders that were very good in combat. I got team sergeants who are really good in garrison. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, Willie, um, one of my team sergeants in Afghanistan, great in garrison, not the best in combat. I, I, I think he was traumatically impacted by some hairy situations and ambushes is what I heard. So he wasn't a guy that liked to get outside the wire, but he was a guy who taught me every aspect of being a garrison NCO and doing the right thing. How to write a con op, how to do an NCOER, how to professionally develop your guys, how to sit down and counsel them to make them better. Which, by the way, like most people who aspire to be in the military think that the war fighting is all there is. And that's all, that. they, that's all there is. That's all there is. What are you they, talking about? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's crazy because they, they fantasize about that career path. And, you know, I certainly virtue signal about a combat experience. But like you said, 95% of that experience was in garrison, was training up to deploy to do the thing. So everybody fantasizes about combat until you're on the wrong end of a fucking PKM. Yeah, that's Don't true too. 300 wind mag. That's true too. Fucking yeah. hucking heat at you. Um, <laughs> this actually <laughs> sucks a big old dick. When I see uh, Instagram influencers <laughs> doing shoot, move, and communicates, like I mean, they're just doing shoot. They're not even doing move yeah. and communicate. What? But uh, they just focus on shooting Is the he gun. Yeah. Are you joking? No, like the influencer who's doing all the I don't. all the things, it's only focused on shooting the gun. Mm. Never focused on like 
the most difficult task, like communicating, filling your fucking radio, PCIs, rehearsals, planning. Like if you've never been in isolation doing MDMP, you've never lived. And it's like that it's the mis- military decision making process yeah, for people. Military like, fun, what yeah. the fuck is Mike talking in an about? ISO Super facility? <laughs> Super like fun. I think Green Berets actually invented this whole idea of the ISO fact because it became a popular you can't portion of the training. Claim Green Berets. I think invented we did. He's I'm pretty sure. You can, he can claim I'm whatever he wants. Sure. I'm, I'm pretty sure. You know what? You're right. The Green Berets <laughs> invented military planning. <laughs> they did. did you guys have planning nobody, and training at nobody all? Nobody planned did, anything Navy before train fucking at all? Green Berets. They're all in route. They're jumping out of the airplane. They're like, we're doing this, right? Like, no. yeah. It's like, that's then, our con ops. First off, <laughs> what you said is incorrect because at no point in time did we look in the mirror to make sure our hair was correct and three finger swiped <laughs> out of the face. <laughs> <laughs> And then jump yeah. out of there. And we plan <laughs> well, it in route. We'll do you plan know it in why route. the SEAL community prefers the Silver Ranger compass over anything else? Why? Because it has a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need this for signaling. Um, I, I, like the, I realized it's like being in recce did uh, lay this down and made it, made, it, made it real for me. Because I always thought, and I aspired to be a sniper. That's all I wanted. I, Carlos Hathcock... The what is it called the the marine or marine sniper? Hmm? Um, reading that book as a kid over and over again, and buying the ultimate sniper by John Plaster, which I still have the mm-hmm. copy. I bought that book from Ranger Joe's when I was twelve years old. I got an um, autographed copy when I was at Swick. I got an autographed copy of Secret Commandos, the other book. Oh, yeah. wrote when yeah. he went really when he came to uh, uh, the museum. Mm-hmm. But Mike, I, Mike, when you were a sniper, did you ever? Use target ammo on target. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> target ammo on target. Why well, gotta bring up old shit, Andy? <laughs> you know what's funny is about that is like you know what I realized about everything about that ammo. We always shot national match ammo. Yeah. We never had in our time period. We never had um, destructive rounds. It was always like Full Metal Jacket, Sierra Match King. 77 grain LR or so whatever. You, did, you used to take like, target, of course. You would take target ammo. Of course. Over, one shot, nine shots, one kill. That's what I say. I yep. counted a few more than nine. There was nine. <laughs> might, might have been 11. Yeah. Um, I was just curious. God. <laughs> pain. Back to the how Navy SEALs never plan. Um, so I, I realized quickly in fantasizing about being behind the gun and doing the, the thing. And then being in the MSS as a team sergeant in recce and literally doing the actual thing, which was like suffering and consolidating fucking PowerPoint products and HBW, you know, high performance wave and sending shit out. It's like, that's what the job is. Yeah. And so I had in every facet of those guys that were great at all those things. Mm-hmm. Set that aside, the, one of the best leaders that I've seen through demonstration of leadership at the command level was Tom DiTomaso who was a Ranger PL in Black Hawk Down. He was also the B squadron commander when I worked worked for him. And he was, you know, he was in charge of task force. So he had an action arm of the unit, Rangers, Dev, like everybody who's an action arm. And he went out on target with us all every opportunity he got. And you could just tell by the way he led that he was a guy who was in the trenches with the guys getting the job done but could quickly elevate mm. command, communicate to um, the unit commander, to JSOC, to the president of the United States, because he was just that guy. He became the deputy of deputy commander of the unit. For some reason, he didn't take it, and I think he weighed his family over extending his career. Mm. And I'll tell you one of the most, the, the, the weirdest things ever, I ever uh, confronted with when I was still on active duty. I think I went to SHOT Show in the military, they had sent me uh, to represent USASOC. And I was there and I saw him, he just retired. And he was sitting in a booth telling somebody about a sling. And it was like, you know, one of the guys, it might've been Vita, whatever it was, he was pitching somebody about a sling. And I remember thinking to myself, because the kid who he's talking to had no, in fact, when the kid walked by, I was like, do you know who that is? And he's like, I have no clue. He's like, sell him a sling. I'm like, holy shit. It, and it, I, I had the realization, no matter who you are, yeah. 
how you're defined in by peers, by other members of your organizations, eventually you get out and all that is behind you and you start from scratch, you start over. Mm-hmm. Um, but Tom DiTomaso, I, I could probably say without a shadow of a doubt, as far as being at a command level was that guy. And then uh, Ben Bittner, who is a, a friend of mine who was killed, uh, my son Ben's name after him, um, he was one of the best Green Berets I've ever met, but he was just a good fucking leader. He was the guy who said, uh, when he was a team sergeant, he said, you guys will up, uphold the standard. And then everyone's like, what do you mean uphold the standard? Like, yeah, you'll do this number of reps in physical training or you won't be on my team. And everybody's like, what? It's like, that should be the standard. But we had to fight for that. And he never wavered. And he was just always that guy who was right place, right time, right uniform. And and crush bad guys. was He was all the things. A really, really great dude. And a great leader. Even I wasn't on his team because we were peers. But according to all his guys as well, he was a profound leader. And he died leading the charge. I mean, he died literally leading his guys into harm's way. And paid for it with his life. So... Um, yeah, shitty leaders. Like if you could sum up some of the experiences that you saw in shitty leaders, like what is that thing? Because we saw it a lot and we said, don't be that guy, but I'm actually interested to to hear your take on it because as you said yesterday, um, during the resilience rendezvous, you actually at the highest levels saw both the best and the worst leaders. Galactically bad leadership. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. I'm, I'd be shocked if you guys didn't say the same, see the same thing. Yeah, what yeah, I, for the, sure. Like, and when I say this every time I talk about leadership, I serve with the best leaders I've ever seen and the most atrocious human beings I've ever been around. Yeah, like this, it's a selection process, but it's not perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> bad leadership qualities. These are actually easier. I mean, the, the most destructive one I've ever seen is just a massive ego, mm-hmm. the inability of a leader to control their ego, being very self serving, and it's just like they wear it on their shoulder. Like, oh my god, um, and the inability to control their emotions. Mm. They just get emotionally wrapped up and so tied to the outcome. And it's a fucking train wreck and it's infectious too. The emotional thing is infectious, Mm. but those are the two like number, the number one and two, not necessarily in that order, but those are the two like really poor exhibitions of leadership that I saw in the leaders. I didn't want to work for. Did you, do you think I'm I'm interested in this? Cause I've seen this in real time. I've experienced it. Guys that I knew on active duty who were really toxic, Mm. I mean, they, they were just that guy. Everybody knew they were that guy. And you thought, I thought it was just like uh, that unit thing, that military thing, that rank and position, that TL thing. And then they get out and they're just as bad in civilian life. Yeah, they're just people. So, so you think that those guys transitioning out from the military experience, it wasn't just the military. That's just who they are. That's who they are. And the problem is if they get into those units, they have a bullet on a resume that opens doors that they shouldn't walk through. Mm. And then they do and they have a bad experience. It's not a matter of if they're going to have a bad experience. It's a matter of when. And then oftentimes that door shuts mm-hmm. to anybody else from that community. Interesting. What about you, Evan? Examples of bad leadership? Well, examples of bad leadership <laughs> in the context of like, how did it affect you and, and your perception of it? Because I, I know, wow. I mean, we probably on an ODA, you've likely seen it all. Well, yeah, I mean, there's so many different examples. I mean, I think to to maybe cast a, a few different things out there that Andy didn't mention, but I mean, a glaringly obvious thing that he mentioned that I'll agree with is like ego and then the me's. I always classify people as mission and me's. Like I, I, it's a 50-50, it's somewhat binary. And I know there's people that are kind of in between, but the me's can disguise themselves as mission first for a finite amount of time. Interesting. They yeah. can disguise, yeah. right? And uh, they'll eventually be promoted to a point where they have uh, authority mm-hmm. and their subordinates will pay for their ego and me first mentalities and they create really toxic work environments. And to point out specific examples is that, you know, me's are more concerned with career progression than they are with the actual mission. So Mm -hmm. they have a complete inability to put the needs of the, the unit and the mission ahead of themselves. And they'll put themselves in positions where they can 
they can not only inflate their own ego, but then ultimately get themselves promoted and nothing is off the table, uh, meaning they'll, they'll jeopardize the mission and they'll jeopardize the men, the men to get themselves promoted or into a position where they will either get validated ego or put themselves into a position where they can continue to develop their rank. So if a guy wants a star, it's a really good example from a, you know, whether you want it as a CSM or if you want it as, as a, you know, as an, as an O, if they want a star, they're going to do whatever the fuck it takes to get a star. They don't care. And like I said, they will disguise themselves as mission because that's what they need, but they're fucking sociopaths. Like they, they need to feed their egos and they don't give a shit what they have to do in order to get there. And I've seen multiple different layers of that um, where, whether it's at the agency, whether it's, you know, in SF, whether it's, you know, in, in, in business, you know, I've seen multiple different layers of that. Um, and then those types of things, they, they just kind of cascade all the different negative attributes that we could outline like one by one. It would take us another 15 hours of podcasting for me to outline those things. But uh, y- y- there's, to Andy's point, like I've seen really, really poor behavior um, from all the way to the top, like politicians to oh, yeah. guys in the Pentagon, like politicians are probably the fucking worst, but you know, and then, but when you're in the Pentagon, depending on, and this is like very subjective based on, on what rank you are and where you are in the Pentagon. So it's not everybody, but it's, it's very much exemplified in the fact that they become politicians. So they're playing the same type of game. Um, and you, we could, we could kind of outline that from the context of Afghanistan or Iraq, you know, people, um, continuing in like, we'll call it this, this facade that yeah, I remember really early on having kind of the, the, the look behind the curtain and sitting in a uh, Najaf watching the news and listening to Rumsfeld talk about, uh, lawlessness and bandits. This was just a group of criminals in Iraq. And we we're like, are you fucking crazy? Like, this is an insurgency, man. Like, I don't know what you're, I don't know who's briefing you what, but this is a fucking insurgency. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And, and then you had this, what what I used to, what I used to talk about was like, uh, just a symphony of yes men that were beneath him. It was like a, a pool of, of shiny rank, just ready and willing to get on their knees and just fucking suck the dicks off of every politician they could. Oh man, they would dude. Oh, good God. If they, if it got them promoted, they would say or do anything it took to get a star, right? Whatever it was. So they were passing misinformation, validating lies, you name it. Like it was just, just a symphony of horseshit with these idiots. And it, like when, when I look at just kind of like that, that 2005, we'll call it, um, the amount of self-serving me's that were in the military at that point that had never seen or, or tasted the, uh, what I would say is, is the profound remorse of loss and the agony of combat, like in the, in the true sense, it was a game. It was truly a game and they were willing to fucking jeopardize people's lives in order to validate their careers to do bullshit. And I, for me, a lot of that stuff, I can't, I can't forgive it. Like, I just can't like they had a complete they had a complete disconnection from the realities of war and they were willing to um, uh, pass, pass edicts that would, that would continue to get people put in harm's way ultimately for what, for their careers. And I'm not saying all of it, by the way, I'm just saying a lot of it. You're like, I mean, Ambar, you think about Ambar, Everybody fucking knew what was going on there. Like we all knew like, dude, as an E6, I knew what the fuck was going on there. Like I didn't need to be 
and you know, in 06, I was, as an E6, I knew what the fuck was going on there. Everybody did. And you it was feel fucking it. crazy to me that these guys continued to essentially lie. And I didn't know if it was just a complete disconnection from reality or if they were just like serving it up like, you know, soft serve ice cream because some idiot in a suit wanted it to be real. I'm not exactly sure, but it's, it, it's you know, regardless. So I, I have a litany of different ways that we can, we can outline this and, you know, the failures of, of bad leaders along the way, you know, guys that had no ability to lead by example, they could only lead by title. Uh, they're completely self-serving. Um, they couldn't live within the context of reality. Um, they, uh, what, you know, what we, I think you guys probably get the, the correlation here, but it's like, you know, there's a lot of guys that just need to be punched in the fucking face because they need to understand what it feels like a lot of what I would say, the GS 15 SIS level CIA guys, they needed to get in a fucking gunfight yeah. because I don't know about you guys, like, which, which is a different set of things, but the fear associated with people shooting at you or a combination complex attack, the fear associated with that event is so acute that it changes your perspective as to what the fuck you're doing. And I don't know if you get, if you guys were so, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you're just better. <laughs> I don't know, but it never, it never like left. It was, it was like, Oh, I just don't have any more fear. I'm a fucking goddamn hero. It's like, no man, it's fucking scared out of my goddamn mind. Like it doesn't get easier. I mean, I, it gets easier to facilitate within the requirements of the job based on the time and repetition and experience because you understand the cadence and flow of the action. But it's not as if the fear goes away. Like it, it, it fucking sucks. You like need it to fucking stop doing, sucks. You need to stop doing the job if the fear goes away. Yeah, yeah, that's because you're fucking yeah. at a very dangerous point in your life, which is probably about to end. But a lot of these guys, like they, they needed that. They needed to get out of their armored vehicles, they needed to get into the street and they needed to put themselves into the first hand experience of what that E3 saw gunner was actually feeling, you know, on the outskirts of Sodder city in 2000 fucking six at three 30 in the morning, they needed to feel that in order to understand what type of command decisions they were making. Yeah. They did anyway. It was a rant. I don't even know what the fuck. Oh, it was point good. Is. It was solid. We gotta wrap this up. Let's talk about Asian things. <laughs> There's so many. We have to. We're doing an underground version. It's for sale. Yeah, There's a link fuck down yeah. below. You guys can buy that. Clearhot.com. <laughs> Which is not the website. Just <laughs> <laughs> is it not? No. What is it? Clearhotpodcast. Oh Jesus! You don't own clearhot.com. <laughs> I mean, you have a talk business. We'll get you squared away. You can have multiple. What are we gonna close with? What domains. should we close with? What do people need to know? Well, we got a lot going on. I mean, there's one of the things that we talked about in the beginning of this podcast was the idea of like getting to a place where we're not so suppressed based on all the garbage that's going on, where Tucker Carlson is a prime example, where a organization, because they didn't like what he said, mm -hmm. which seemingly is talking about praying 10 minutes a day. That's seemingly what they reported as why he was released. Getting away from that means like doing what we did with the G14 newsletter, like get the fuck away and have some redundancy built into this system. I mean, Jared Taylor from Black Rifle Coffee is gonna do some input for some content, me, you, Evan, and... and Evan said he was going to, but he's too busy. Yes. Actually, mm -hmm. I think the idea for it largely came from you guys, though, in your mailing list. Like, how do you actually directly communicate with somebody? Because even like this podcast, it'll be on video and audio. And it'll get suppressed. Well, whether it gets suppressed or not, I yeah. mean, I guess you, how, depending on how Machiavellian you want to get with it, like at, at some point in time, they could just be like, no, you can't yeah. put it up there anymore. So how do you actually communicate with somebody yeah. unless you own the medium for the communication? Yeah. You have to. You, you have to. You have to clear. I was going to use clear hot. Yeah. Um, no, you, you have to clear the way of what I would say is the third party uh, platform any third third party platform. So whether that's made it meta Instagram, you know, that could be iTunes or YouTube or anyone like at any point in time, it could all go away. It can all 
go away because it's just the world we live in. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even our newsletter for a period of time got suppressed because they identified something in the newsletter that they didn't like. Seriously? And it triggered to go to spam. And is this when you were deep into being a domestic terrorist or was this that's, after? No, this is recently. Yeah. This is when okay. me and you started doing stuff and you probably got associated. You got targeted mm, because of your association. Yeah. Cool. You're now good. a facilitator of terrorism. Yeah. Some, some, <laughs> um, you are what you are, you know? Yeah, you're in the network. You're in a target package. <laughs> but we did that and that's what we're doing. We're just doing a whole bunch of shit like that. But we got a lot of going on. Like we got mm -hmm. events at Black Rifle Coffee in Kalispell. A I bunch got of them in May and June. May and June. I have a book party release with you. June 10th? June 10th. Sweet. And I have one with you. I'm I'm jumping July. in Normandy. So when um, You want to jumping in Normandy? June 6th? Yeah. yeah. Actually, you'll be jumping oh. on the 7th or 8th because I was going to go on that trip and now I cannot. Why? Because so, oh. I'm going on a uh, Rogan show on the 6th. Oh, yeah. Is it a static line or is it a free fall? No, I'm going to do a static and then I'm going to do a free fall. So I'm, I've got to do a static line. Like I'm not, I'm not going to go yeah, to you Normandy. you can't do a But you have to dress up. In Dude. World War II, oh God. like so, so I'm badass. I'm dressing up in the actual uniform, so I'm 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 gonna do it because I was like, "Fuck, dude!" Like it's it's do you it's only Normandy. get one chance at it, dude. Do not hook up your static line and just fire your just reserve. Just fucking do it. Just, just fire just your fire reserve. the reserve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take I, like you'll go out of like a take like a four count. <laughs> <laughs> Are you doing it at 800? Would they do it at 600 feet fuck, AGO likely? Knows. No, fuck no. I, I, I'm, low sure that, I'm sure. I'm sure they're going to do it at like. You'd probably be like fifteen hundred. Yeah, okay. like, which, dude, this is going to be epic. Are you kidding me? I wish I, I could have gone so, on yeah. that. I, I still am so. going to go over there at some point. That's on my absolute bucket list. I I have to do it. Yeah. Like I, I like I'm taking the kids out there, so I'm going to show them. Yeah, we were talking about. We're going to walk. Yeah. Literally, we're going to take the entire route from. So we're going to start in the UK. We're going to go across the channel. We're going to go through Fuck Normandy yeah. and up into Paris. That's exactly what we're going to do. So I'm taking my six-year-old, my nine-year-old, uh, and I'm going to really unpack like what it means, what what this actually mean, what it means today. What's the historical context? Like why is it important for us to understand what the true value of life is and ultimately sacrifice? Like just the fact that we're going to be driving through Europe without, you know, swastikas, how fucking important that is. Like, so, and eventually I think I'm going to do the same thing in the Marshall Islands. I want to take the kids and I want to take everybody down and go through like Peleliu and Oki and all those Brutal. different islands. So down for all that. Yeah. And like, but they're, they're not going to grow up like hitting every fucking beach. <laughs> so I'm yeah. going to take the girls and they're going to see every beach. And I'm going to walk them through it and go, this is what these guys experienced. Oki was brutal, man. What a, give us one secret. What can people look forward to? Black Rifle Coffee in the next, because this will come out in like a week. Mm -hmm. Tell us one thing you're not supposed to, that they should look forward to. One thing that people can look forward to. I am rebranding the ECS. Okay. I am. Which so, I still believe stands for Evans Coffee Subscription. That's, that's what it's going to be called. Because <laughs> I can't remember. Like, is it fucking executive? Uh, I'm like, it's Evans Coffee. I'm rebranding the ECS, <laughs> and uh, it's going to be like super, super cool. So right. look forward to that. Awesome. See you guys. Tell us one secret about Fieldcraft we're not supposed to know. Uh, the app drops June 6th. You Seriously? Talk what, what I talk called? about the book. What is it called? It's the Fieldcraft Survival app. We, we, uh, what we're done doing. Pedestria, I know. Pedestria. We're Pedestria. just done doing fancy names. Yeah, probably abbreviated like FCS or something. FCS? It could That's be FCS. Cool. It, will be FCS. <laughs> it will be FCS. It will be the logo. FCSA. FCSA. It will yeah. be that. Fasa. I like that. Fasa. And that is everything from canning and jarring to self-defense mindset the whole fucking shebang Fuck so, yeah. the whole shebang we've been doing that it's been like years in the making probably two years in the making and the guys are like getting it done we're, we just filmed a hundred mobility videos Jesus. this last week a really? hundred yeah because they're they're segments but like everything from recovery to maintenance to first aid survival Man. uh overlanding off-roading it's yeah. gonna be yeah. it's gonna be yeah, you mailed it in yeah, yeah. mailed it in. Yeah. probably yeah. 50 of those are so par but yeah you guys could have a subscription if you pay for it on June 6th. Don't worry. I might I will, give you a discount I will code. pay for it. Clear and hot saves you 5%. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, nice. Yeah, Clear and hot should charge you 20% more. Yeah. <laughs>
Buy two shirts, you pay shipping. Wait, what, what do we, hold on though. Before before we go, yep. you have the new series that you're change agents. Oh, yeah. change yeah. agents. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And I'm and I, you said I'm, what, what was the plan for? Yeah, we're, we're gonna, gonna do an episode, right? Yeah, Evan was the second one that was released. Oh, that's right. I saw that. That was really good. You didn't see it. You saw that he actually was on it. I guarantee you didn't listen to a word of it because you're not a good friend. I wow. I did. I literally am gonna go on your website today and buy every I, fucking shirt. That I, you I have. did not see any of it. And small to include the thumbnails that they sent over for me to post. I did not see. Yeah. You didn't any see of any of it. Fuck no, I was there. Why do I need to fucking yeah. watch it? Yeah. Why do you need a cross burner? You were there. So twenty five episodes is what I agreed to do with them. Twenty five. Like, yeah, that's fucking impressive. Yeah. It's not, but it's. On it, like how easy is it to sit down and talk to people you're interested in? You do it for a living. Couldn't be easier. And they are they sourced all of the guests. I think we've got 18 of them in the can, so I got another. And that's if they don't split a couple of the in-person ones into two episodes. But it's either a social issue, economic issue, person, whatever. Mm. The, the, there's more things that people could pay attention to, and there's time in the day. So it's kind of like finding a subject matter expert on an issue that people hopefully care about and then exploring that with the expert and then leaving them with things they can do if they want to get involved. Where does, not, that, where does that live at? Same place that podcasts, I mean, normal ones do. It's just a different, it's a different podcast. Right. Shorter, generally 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and the cool thing about it is it's the same team behind Jack Cars. Ironclad, podcast, Ironclad. Right? Yeah. Super high production. Great. Super high production value. So, all right. Makes cool. it easy. We're done. Bye. Let's go piss. Bye. <laughs>